should be talking about this may contain graphic descriptions and or explicit content that may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everybody, this is Key. And this is V. Welcome to our new ASMR podcast. We should listen to this. Now, uh, passengers, we are going to take off on the... Uh... <laughs> okay, I can't keep this up. <laughs> no, I think we just got uh, some uh, unlistened there. <laughs> you know. uh, hey everybody, this is Key. And this is V. And this is We Shouldn't Talk About This. Key, how are you today? I'm good. The sun is shining. It's a beautiful day. I had my sunroof open, my windows down, my charger pushing 90 up the freeway. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Uh, allegedly 90, right? Allegedly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, it does sound like a very nice time. It is very nice outside. We are. We seem to be basking in the month of May already, which mm. is crazy. Extremely. Yeah. Still on a semi-quarantine, but not too bad. Not too bad, no. Mm-mm. People are less freaked out now, so that's good. Yeah, that's always good. So, Key, okay, what should we not talk about today? What have you been wanting to not talk about? You know, I always wondered what happens when a young person commits a crime. Mm-hmm. Like, are they treated like an adult? Are they just sent to, like, a juvie. boy's home, a girl's home, juvie kind of situation? Like, I don't know what happens there. I've n- never personally, like, seen cases where uh, an underage person has been tried as an adult before. Okay, that is interesting. And it seems like a lot of factors kind of play a role the prosecutor, the judge, mm-hmm. you know, how old exactly, what Ye- type of crime it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we should get into that. Yeah. Would you like to start? Sure. My case is very interesting. It's actually a Supreme Court case. Oh, wow. Yes, it made it that far. Okay, then. So, gather around, children. It's time for a tell a crime. So my story today is about Evan Miller. Evan Miller was born on November 2nd, 1988 to Susan and David Miller. According to Evan's sister, Aubrey Miller Goldstein, their father was a truck driver who spent most of the week on the road. But he'd come home seething, quote, almost looking for something to get angry about and beat them with a leather belt, leather belt <laughs> with a heavy buckle an accessory Goldstein said her father wore as a weapon. Now Goldstein said she has a finger that doesn't move properly due to damage to one of her knuckles from that belt. Evan, the youngest, had a seemingly permanent welt across one buttock, the shape perfectly perfect shape of a belt. The boys Evan and older brother John occasionally got kicked with his steel-toed boots too. Wow. Yeah, he's he's a pretty bad guy. Now, now it's about to get even more rough. Their father once killed a kitten that had urinated on the kitchen floor, slamming it against the wall and forcing his children to watch as it died. Oh my goodness, this monster. Yes. Now, he's not the one who got in trouble though. This is just painting a, a picture like, you know, they wanted to paint the picture of the backstory as the type of life he kind of came from. So, or I guess I should say, I wanted to paint the picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the family moved from house to house, racking up a chain of evictions across several North Alabama towns. And that's Alabama in the U.S. for people who may not know. Because mm. we're international, baby. Yes, yes. Spain, (laughs) Australia, shout it out. Um, Child welfare agencies in four counties had files on the family. The cops got called several times, including once when older brother John took refuge at a neighbor's house and the neighbor faced their father down with a shotgun to protect him. That's according to their sister. So... Their mother repeatedly passed on pressing charges, even when her husband threatened her with the gun. So it seems like they just really couldn't win. If they tried to leave, he would come looking for them. Their mother wouldn't really do anything. So 
Goldstein, the sister, recounted hiding behind a police car after calling officers to their home in that incident um, where the father pulled a gun on the mother, only to have the officer tell her there was nothing he could do. She was 11. Meanwhile, she said their mother told the children horror stories about foster care to keep them from telling the truth about what was happening at home. Oh my gosh. The children were finally taken away when their father bruised her eye, her being the sister, the night before she and Evan went to a summer camp run by child welfare authorities. They spent 17 months with the foster family. And that was a stretch that saw the children get basics like clothes and regular meals, as well as structure and rational discipline. Now, while the kids were in foster care, Susan Miller left her husband. She got supervised visitations with the children and then eventually got custody of them back. They went to live with her in a mobile park where Goldstein says drug use was rampant and their home was chaos. Mm. Now, Evan flourished in foster care and he did not want to go back. Unfortunately, it's not the child's choice. So soon, everyone in the family was drinking or smoking pot or using speed. Oh, man. Now, we're going to jump to July 15th, 2003. Evan, who was 14, and Colby Smith, who was 16, and they were friends. They got into a fight with a neighbor who was allegedly drunk. The neighbor, Cole Cannon, was 52. He was renting the trailer in the mobile home park, and it was either behind or next to the Millers. I saw differing reports. Hmm. Cole had only lived in Country Living Trailer Park for approximately three weeks. One version of the story goes, Cole was having problems with the installation of his own phone and came over to use the Millers' phone. Another story says Cole Cannon came by to make a drug deal with Miller's mom. So, regardless of which one is true, the teens followed Cannon to his trailer. All three allegedly smoked weed and drank, and Cannon ended up passing out, and Miller robbed him. Now, Cole Cannon had a baseball card co collection, and many years prior had owned a baseball card shop. So, he, you know, more than likely had some good, expensive cards. Yeah, yeah. So, Evan and Colby stole some of his baseball cards, Cole's driver's license, and some of the money in, from his wallet. While they were in the process, Cole awoke, grabbed Miller, and Smith struck the man with a baseball bat. Throughout the night, Evan and Colby would make several trips back and forth from Cole's residence to the Miller's residence. They both beat him with the baseball bat and their fist. Evan Miller placed a t-shirt or a sheet, depending on the, the source, over Cole's head and said, Cole, I am God and I have come to take your life. The two boys set Cole's trailer on fire, then returned to Miller's trailer. Yeah, this, this kind of ramped up pretty quick. A few minutes later, however, Miller and Smith returned to Cannon's trailer to attempt to clean up the blood. Wait, okay, so. All right, I kind of got ahead of myself. So, after they beat him, they left, came back to attempt to clean up the blood, but realized they couldn't, and that's when they set the fire. Okay, okay, okay. So, Smith used a lighter to set the fire on a couch in the back bedroom while Miller set another fire on a different couch to cover up evidence. As they were leaving, Smith saw Cannon just lying there. Feeling sorry for Cannon, Smith placed a towel under his head in an attempt to stop the bleeding, according to him. Smith also turned on the faucet in the kitchen and stopped it up, hoping the water would extinguish the fires. Hmm. As they were leaving Cannon's trailer, Smith heard Cannon asking, Why are y'all doing this to me? 
Approximately 10 minutes later, Smith returned to Cannon's trailer alone. He could hear Cannon coughing, but smoke was coming out and Miller was coming up behind him, so he returned to Miller's trailer. Man, that's a nightmare. Right. So he knew he was alive. They had set multiple fires and just left him. And then when I guess his conscience started to get the better of him, he wanted to go back but bailed. Mm. So the firefighters who were called to the trailer park to extinguish the fire at Cannon's trailer noticed blood on a coffee table and blood splatters on the wall. This led firefighters to the discovery of Cannon's body in the hallway leading to the back bedroom. Now, the fire did not engulf the whole place, obviously. Cannon had died of blunt force trauma, multiple rib fractures, and smoke inhalation. Fire Marshal Richard Montgomery, who conducted the initial investigation, concentrated on the north bedroom where most of the damage from the fire had occurred. The investigation was later turned over to investigator Tim Sandlin of the Sheriff's Department after the fire marshal Montgomery indicated the fire was obviously suspicious. I mean, of course, there was at least three points of origin as well as paper with charred ends in a trash can in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So after talking to Cannon's family members, investigator Sandlin became aware that certain items were missing from the trailer. Cannon's wallet was eventually recovered from under the couch in his trailer, but his driver's license was missing. Investigator Sandlin also found a baseball bat underneath the couch. So obviously this is the couch that Evan tried to set fire to in the front room, thinking it was going to destroy everything, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. So after this discovery, investigator Sandlin went to the Miller's trailer to speak with Miller and his mother, Susan. Susan gave investigator Sandlin a box of trading cards, and Miller and his mother agreed to ride with him to the sheriff's office to give statements. Now, after, no, not after, at the sheriff's office, investigator Sandlin obtained basic information from Miller and read him his rights from the juvenile Miranda form, which Miller and his mother both signed before Miller began recounting the events of the night of July 15th and the early morning of July 16th. He gave different versions of the story, though, which is why some say a sheet, some say a towel. A towel. Yeah. Some say he came for a drug deal. Some say he came to use the phone. Like, these were all mm. Miller's statements. Like, he kept changing his story up. Yeah. So, in October 2006, Kobe Smith pled guilty to felony murder and received a life with parole sentence. Miller was convicted by, now this right here, I think maybe the defense was trying to get like sympathy because he was convicted by an all-female jury, hmm. which were mostly mothers of capital murder, arson, and capital murder, robbery. Evan was sentenced to a mandatory life without parole in the state of Alabama at the time for such, a, such an offense at age 17. Wow. So even though he was 14 when he did it, he got life without parole. Hmm. Miller's case made or Miller's case appeals made its way up to the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS. SCOTUS. As Miller v. Alabama. The SCOTUS, which had recently been indirectly effectuating progressively more merciful sentencing for juvenile offenders by holding that certain sentences were unconstitutional violations of the Eighth Amendment. Do you know what the Eighth Amendment is? The Eighth Amendment. I do, do not do, know what do, the Eighth do, Amendment do, do. is. I'm just kidding. The Eighth Amendment is excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. That's the part. They were fighting that 
a life sentence for a 14 year old without parole was cruel and unusual. Cruel and unusual. Now, in 2005, the court held that capital punishment for juveniles was unconstitutional, and in 2010, held as unconstitutional life without parole for juveniles who committed offenses that did not involve homicide. Mm. In 2012, in Miller's case, the court ultimately held that mandatory sentences for juveniles of life without parole for any offense violated the Eighth Amendment's prohibition. Prohibition. Prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. The court stated that the right not be subjected to excessive sanctions from the basic precept of justice that punishment for crime should be granted and proportioned to both the offender and the offense. In an effort to tailor appropriate sentences to juveniles, the court stated that courts should recognize that juveniles have diminished culpability and greater prospects for reform. And therefore, they are less deserving of the most severe punishments. The court further held that although a life sentence without parole could potentially be appropriately applied to juvenile offenders in homicide cases, the cases where such a sentence would be appropriate were certainly rare, and there were several what have now been called Miller factors, mm-hmm. as they um, became to came to be known, which a judge would be required to take into account before imposing such a sentence on the juvenile. Now that was a lot. That was like directly out of the actual legal briefing. So, these factors that the judge um, are required to take into account include the age of the offender, the role in the crime, and the background and upbringing, which is why a lot of Miller's background and upbringing was the start of this story, because that is something they were trying to get the judge to take into account. account. Right. Hmm. After this landmark decision... States begin to revisit sentences of juveniles incarcerated for life without parole. In March 2017, Evan finally got a resentencing hearing. Many family, friends, foster family members, and even a former warden testified on Miller's behalf. However, Miller is still at the maximum security St. Clair lockup outside of Birmingham, and there is no parole consideration date on file. Okay, okay. So, even though he had a landmark case that was a Supreme Court case, ultimately, it doesn't look like it's benefited him. No, uh uh-uh. So, I mean... I don't know. What What do you think? Do you think they should at least gave him a parole date? I mean, I mean, after the Supreme Court made their ruling. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they should at least give him a date. Yeah. I think so. They should have. Yeah. Because, I mean, if, if he went in... Okay, so he was arrested in 2003. Okay. So, by the time he went to trial, he was already in jail for three years. Yeah. So... They could have given him maybe like 15 years and then the possibility of parole. Mm -hmm. Because in 15 years, he would have been like 29, almost 30. Yeah. I I think that they could have at least taken the without parole off of it. Right, yeah. But unfortunately, since he was the main instigator of the crime... It did not work out in his favor, but it did work out in the favor of juveniles coming up. Now they get more consideration because, you know, kids are just not able to process, like, the ultimate 
finality of certain crimes. Yeah, like the the weight of the consequences that lead from doing something like right. that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's good that they, they are now taking that into consideration. It's crazy that it took to 2017, <laughs> yeah. 2012, like in into the alts. That is really crazy. But, you know, hopefully they will take this more into consideration and not give these children life without parole because, like they said, children can be rehabilitated. I yeah. believe that. Yeah. Now, if you're 40 out here murdering people, I th- it's yeah, too Yeah, it's yeah too you're late. too far gone. Throw the key away. <laughs> Man. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing about these cases. Like, you know, they're very, they're very touchy because... Because unfortunately, like, you know, someone did die through this. And it yeah. was a very brutal way of going, too. Right. And, and Mr. Cannon had family. He had yeah. children. You know, he, he had moved because he was trying to get his life back together. Right. And he did, it's not like he even really knew this family. He'd only been there three weeks. Mm. So, you know, it, it was very, it's very sad, very brutal. I'm sure maybe the family on his side is happy that uh, Miller isn't getting any type of parole consideration as yeah, of yet. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, yeah, Keith, that was a very, very uh, good case. It was nice build-up, nice uh, story building to that. It was and, a roller coaster ride. Yeah, it was a roller coaster ride. And it led to something that the Supreme Court now put into play going mm-hmm. forward. So let's get on that. Yeah. My case is... um. Uh, from the 90s, from the late 90s. Mm. And it's a good time, good time. And we are going to Colorado. This tale, this tale is the fall of Terry Perry. All right. Now, I do not have much information on Terry, on Terry Perry's home life or younger life, but I do know that Terry Perry, that Terry Perry was a shy sophomore at Aurora Central High School a member of the soccer and speech teams, and she had a boyfriend, and she had a few friends, of course, on each of the respective teams that she was on. Cool, cool, okay. Um, Tara was 16 years old, and her boyfriend was 22. Oh, gross. They met three years prior to this. You know, so she was only thir- 13, and he was 19. Oh, her family should have nipped that in the bud in the beginning, but who am I to judge? Right, right, right. So uh, the nineteen, well, the twenty-two-year-old boyfriend is Randy Miller, and Randy was an intriguing bundle of romance and doom. Oh God, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like something a sixteen-year-old girl would write. A former child prostitute who worked Colfax at the age of ten and was frequently in trouble. Wait a minute, he was a child prostitute. Yeah. Oh, Randy, I'm sorry. Yeah. So so. I'm sure you can tell, like, from this scarring of his life that he probably is not doing the right things going right. forward. And he's probably not as mentally developed as a normal, quote-unquote normal, 22-year-old. Like, you know, he's probably traumatized a lot from what he went through. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, Tara wrote to him when he went to prison and moved in with him when he got out. Randy wooed and wowed her. But he also beat her and kept her away from her family and managed to know her whereabouts at all times. Then Randy messed up his parole. Determined not to go back to jail, he decided it was time to split. But not before he raised some cash and with the help of Tara and some other parolees. They walked into people's houses, stuck guns in their faces, helped themselves to whatever money and vehicles they could find. They Damn. were just robbing, looting, pillaging, doing Damn. all sorts of all sorts of stuff in the Colorado sector. Mm. But then there was time for a big score. Oh. Time for something to that they can a, a score they can do and then get off the map. Get out of Colorado. We gotta blow this joint, you know? Go disappear into the desert. That's wild right. blue yonder. <laughs> That's right. Do you know what King Supers is? King Supers? Yeah. Sounds like a grocery store. Yeah, it is. It's like it's like a Walmart. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, Randy got his crew and went to King Supers. They're going to rob as much as they can and then flee to Kansas. Kansas? Kansas. No, I mean, I guess you have to have a plan. Okay. Got to have a plan. Okay. 
So all together, there were five of them. They wore ski mask, ski mask and gloves, had guns and semi-auto carbines. They were ready. Sound ready. Um, and, ex- and, ex- and Ford Explorer that was that um, Randy stole was the vehicle of choice. And they had the driver duct tape in the, in the back compartment um, with Tara also back there. So as soon as they got a King Supers, four of them went in and shot up in the air, shot, well, shot into the ceiling, yelling, get down. And then some, like some of the, some of the people, of course, jumped down and then other people ran because they were scared Mm. people with guns and masks. Of course. And then there's only four of them went in. Right. The fifth one was Tara. Okay. Tara was still fumbling around in the backseat of the Explorer. She, she could not get the door unlocked. So she eventually yeah, had child to, locks on it. <laughs> so she eventually had to cl- awkwardly climb over and jump out. And so Tara comes in. Tara, okay, I thought you were gonna say she drove the Florida Explorer like through the window <laughs> or something. Oh, oh man, that been epic. I'm like Tara. That been so good. So, but okay, the child locks tripped her up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was a mindset back. So Tara comes in, 16 years old, five foot two, maybe around 100 pounds. Awkwardly holding her 22 semi-auto with a 72 round clip and pointing it for them in the air. Oh man, hey, she she was packing some heat. She was packing heat, but she was standing there with the with the mask over her face, constantly pulling at it because her eyelashes were stuck around the 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 eyeball rim. So this, so this, the whole part of her is like really, really awkward at this point. It really, she should have just walked back to the to the <laughs> car and just waited. Be the getaway driver. Like if you, if you're having these type of issues, don't, robbery is not for you. You're right. So, so when she finally, so when she finally got the mask settled away, she was looking around trying to find Randy to see where Randy was. Um, she she spotted Randy shooting the locked door of the office where the cash was kept. Um, one of the assailants name, name, uh, Bailey was with a, uh, was with a store clerk and then two other ones were standing around next to some more cashiers, just like intimidating them, yelling at them, hitting them with their guns, just being like, you know, rough, just to show the people that they mean business. Right. And so Tara didn't realize how easy the trigger was to pull on her gun. Okay. So before she knew, she was just spraying the ceilings with bullets, like every, like everything, just going out. And then she freaks out and drops the gun. Tara is like a calamity of disasters. Like this <laughs> whole little robbery. Yes, it was. It's awful. It's like, well, this poor girl. Like you know, you can tell. Well, if it, you were able to sympathize with them, you can tell that this isn't her zone. Right, I mean, if you're going to take somebody to rob something with you, at least train them. At least train them. Just just, just because someone says you're, that you're ride or die, when you go out trying to rob people or rob a big store with a gun, they're not going to be ready. They've never done that before. Right, well, I guess she got more than she bargained for on this one. Absolutely. And so, of course, with her shooting in the ceiling and throwing her gun on the floor, everyone was staring at her. And she would just, she just stood there. This, this right here is the third consecutive day of their crime spree. They're just, they, like from day one, they were just like, robbing, robbing, jacking cars, robbing, robbing, jacking cars. Day two, same thing. Day three, we're going to hit King Supers and then get out of here. So, the, fel- the robbery eventually failed, ultimately. Because the cops showed up. Of course. Um, when the cops showed up, uh, Randy and Kansas split. Um, they left the other three behind. They jumped in the explorer and took off towards Kansas. Wait, Randy and who? Bailey? No, no, Randy and Tara. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. I think I did say Bailey. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, they took off towards Kansas. And when they, when they, they, they got to a small town in Kansas and they crashed. And so they were surrounded by cops at this point. Because, like, you know, it was just, like, the high-speed chase, and they crashed and everything. And so what Randy did, Randy jumped out the car, ran into a nearby house, hit down the door, took people's hostages, and then shot himself in the head. Jeez. Yeah. Did he kill any of the hostages? No, uh-uh. He um, just ran in there, um, ran in there, 
intimidate or try to intimidate cops on the back off. They wouldn't, so he shot himself in the head. Man. Leaving Tara behind all on her lonesome. So of course she was arrested. Right. Um, so these robberies just went down nearly weeks after the nineteen ninety nine Columbine incident. Oh hell. Yeah, so it so everything was much more intensified. Right. Especially with her having the size gun she had and shooting it to the ceiling. Being she, a teenager. Like. Yeah, she was charged as an adult and it sentenced to sixty six years in prison. Whoa. For attempted murder because of the shooting, robbery, assault, and all the other crimes. It is it was tough on her. And like in like on and on, on her space of everything, of course, like, you know, because she was in love with her boyfriend, she was gonna do stupid stuff. No ma'am. Yeah. You, love is not a reason to rob people. No, no, it's not. Um, but her sentence was la- was later reduced to forty years. Um, her her sentence was released was uh reduced to forty years because she cooperated and like right. you know agreed to testify against the other um other ones that were caught. And uh, she did she didn't injure anyone on the on any of the robbery any of the robberies that she did or was part of. She didn't injure anyone. She never shot anyone or never hit anyone. Nothing. Okay. But. There were 20 counts, like, so, yeah, because she's at the grocery store, the the attempted murder times 20. Yikes. Yeah, on the part. So that's what led her to get the extra years attached to her sentence. Because if she was 16, she got 66 years, she would have been, she would have been 72. She would have been 82. Man. When she got out of prison, which is crazy to think about. And so, 2001, that's when the consideration happened, and it was allowed to, uh, the sentence to be served concurrently, trimming the overall time, but her attempts to get an appointed attorney for further appeals have been denied. She's had two minor disciplinary infractions in the decades since she's been in prison. And she's been in prison since 99 or 2000. And so, barely like 20 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, it's like, she's like... Almost halfway there. Um, uh, T- Tara's mom wrote to the judge in 2000 a plea for mercy saying, Tara knows she did wrong and destroyed a big part of her life. If not for Randy and the, other, and the others involved in these crimes, Tara would still be at home, going to school, and have a life ahead of her. And that's it. Well, let that be a lesson to you children. Do not go along with haphazard robbery plans do not not only that i mean her parents or mother you're too little too late with that letter like you should have stopped this whole relationship at the beginning yeah yeah and then she never would have been in this mess no uh uh-uh. but man she i mean at least they reduced it yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, you know, taking in account that she was, you know, a part of it, but did not hurt anyone. I mean, 40 years is still a lot for her role. Oh, yeah. Definitely. But she was a willing participant, and that's, you know, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. That's right. That's right. And, like, even if they went to Kansas, like, what then? Like... I'm sure the money from King Super wasn't going to be enough to have him for the rest of her life. Right. Like, what What was there? Well, the, this is a 16-year-old and a 22-year-old. I'm pretty sure their planning wasn't, mm. you know, They're thinking about the now. Par. Right. Mm. Man, oh, man. So, Key, with those, uh, those cases like that, have you ever had any run-ins with the law as a juvenile? Um, no. No? No, I have not. Well, that is good. Jail free since 93. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really good. That's really good. No, but that is a nice segue into what my good thing is for this week, which is Money Heist on Netflix. It's ridiculous. All you right, gotta right. watch it. It is... 
like I said, if you're going to plan a robbery, train people, and they were trained. <laughs> okay, okay. Money Heist on Netflix. Yes. It is It's good. It's it's exciting. It holds your attention. <laughs> Makes you hold your breath. You're like, will they, won't they? I don't know. <laughs> is this it's, suspenseful it cliffhangers? It is suspenseful, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to check it out then. I, I've been binging it, so... You know, I've almost done with the whole thing, but it's it's been really good. Okay, okay. I'm really slow when it comes to watching like Netflix shows because I like to I like to pretend like it's regular TV. Right. So like I like only enter only only watch them when I'm eating dinner or eating breakfast. Like I'm watching a new episode premiering, and so I I'd like to take it real slow. Okay, Sometimes what? I watch two in a row. Ooh. Yeah. Don't tell no one, okay? Mm, mixing it up. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So oh, what's uh what's good with you? What's what's gonna bring us up? Well, well, um, as of this recording, um, in South Carolina at least, things are getting fairly back to normal. Yes. Um, yes. our shopping mall has just opened back up, our cent- Central Commercial, and I work there. But I'm not going back to work just yet, though. We have to do some um, internal prepping as far as changing the seasons around it and everything. Okay. But um, but people are happy about it, it seems. You know, people are in our mall buying things. Yes. Kind of raises the economy back up. <laughs> did you see the thermal scanner they have when you walk in? Oh uh, Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so high tech. Oh, yeah, real high tech. We're, like, living in the future already. Already. But if only, like, you know, it was like a zombie thing, though, because this one's not too exciting. Mm. I mean, there's been enough excitement. I mean, if excitement is being locked in the house and then raiding your governmental offices because you don't want to be locked in the house anymore. Yeah, yeah. Metaphorical locks, like, you are literally able to leave, but... Yeah. We we definitely hope all of our other countries that listen in to us are doing well in their times of this pandemic yes we definitely hope that you guys are on the downswing of infections Mm -hmm. and getting back to normal yes because all we want to do is go back to normal now we didn't know we had until it's gone we did not and now we know and knowing is half the battle knowing is half the battle yes (laughs) but i do want to shout out Miss Lisa, who is all over our Facebook group. She is so interactive. I definitely appreciate it. It's Mama K. That's her. Thank you, Miss Cooper. And to our new listeners from around the world, I see we got some, like I shout out Spain and Australia and some other countries. Italy, I hope you guys keep tuning in. We love that you're here. Yes, we're we're glad we're glad that we are part of your part of your entertainment regimen. We really are honored. Yes, we are. You know, we we don't forget about Canada, but to me, Canada is like our addict. So it's like <laughs> we are two of the same. Yeah. But we appreciate you guys there as well. Everyone um, who interacts with our Instagram, which is wstat underscore pod and the twitter also wstat underscore pod and the email which is we shouldn't talk about this at gmail.com you know you can always hit us up tell us what you like what you don't like or recommend a case yeah absolutely we'd love to hear from you yes yes let's definitely keep in contact with us on our socials we will be replying to most of the things we get so we would love to hear from you Yes, and also we definitely appreciate anyone that hung in last episode. We do know that the background was noisy, but unfortunately during this time of quarantine, there's some things we can't help, but this one is a lot better. Yeah, and it's like, would we rather not record an episode or give you some interesting stories while we still are able to in different ways? Yes. So, with that being said... I'm Key. And I'm V. And we shouldn't talk about this. Thanks for listening. Bye.